So let me ask you the big question. If I take a traditional vehicle and I, and I swap out what they have traditionally done and I put your system in, is there a, um, is there a cost advantage or a cost disadvantage? So it depends on how you look at it. Here's the ABL study. Yeah, so the, the driver is obviously gonna be more expensive. But so if you look at it from um, a system level perspective, right? So you've, you've got more, more money in the power electronics, but that allows you to wipe out the rare earth magnets in an in a electric motor. It's, it's let's say by going to an induction machine. Um, and I mean, when you look at the price of rare earths, especially if you, um, if you, if you wanna see some, some crazy numbers, like look at the DOE critical materials report for 2023. Um, they, they all sort of start saying like neodymium, dysprosium, these are all, you know, at very, very, supply risk materials um, for the medium and far term for, for a clean energy type application, right? So if we can get rid of those materials, I mean, even if we just ignore the, you know, the environmental impact of refining rare earths is another. Yeah, that's a big problem. It's, yeah. It makes a huge mess. Um, but so needless to say that eliminating these expensive rare earths out of the machine essentially offsets the cost of the drive. So now you've taken, you know, three or $400 of magnets out of, out of the motor. You've added a little bit of cost on the, on the, on the power electronics. Um, and now you've also increased the, the drive cycle efficiency. So you've got a much, much wider, high efficiency operating region, which depending on the drive cycle, depending on the vehicle, depending on the motor, you know, you can get in somewhere between two to six, 7% increase in, in range on, on, depending on what the drive cycle is. You know, if, if you're doing highway cruising, you might see seven to 10% increase. Um, mm. So now you start looking at that saying, well, if I want the same range, I can take 7% of my battery out or 6% of my battery. And I mean, batteries are not, not cheap, right? If you take, um, mm -hmm. you know, six kilowatt hours out, that's a, you know, a couple of grand basically. So um, depending on depending on the end usage, I'd say in commercial trucking, which is where we've we've done and focused a lot of work so far, um, you're going to see up to 20 percent cost savings on the system. And that's an ideal system um, efficiency. So they're eliminating a two speed gearbox. Using but a that's battery. still with a PM motor. That's that's still with a PM motor. Yeah. And so that one, we validated those price points through all the projects that we have. And we're really confident in our ability to take down the cost of a commercial truck substantially. Yeah. On passenger vehicle, it's slightly less because you know, you're know you not gonna have all the mechanical driven components that you have in a commercial truck, but I would say it's still in that kind of 10 to 12% system savings on the overall cost of the vehicle. So the battery, like he said, would save about $700 on, on an electric vehicle on the road today, just from battery savings. Well, that's pretty good, but it sounds to me like, <clears throat> where the real savings are, uh, are for the consumer. Um, it sounds to me like, uh, as a consumer, I probably wind up spending less money per year on electricity and I'd probably get longer range and I would probably get a lighter vehicle, which again would equate to, to range among other things. So, is that part of your um, your uh, business plan then, or absolutely, absolutely yeah, it is one hundred percent. You know, we're we're basically a business to business model, but the actual savings is at that end user, at that consumer user, whether that's you or I driving an electric vehicle or a, a fleet that's driving, you know, to drive down cost on their entire fleet. Does you know, fleet regulations come in prior to passenger vehicle regulations? Well, um, we've we've done a lot of work with um, fleets and uh, companies that manufacture class A trucks for fleets. And uh, those folks, <clears throat> they are very astute when it comes to total accounted cost. And total accounted cost means how much is this thing gonna cost me? And usually the cheapest part of the whole, <clears throat> the whole procedure is buying the initial truck. Regardless of how much you pay for it, the total accounted cost over a year is vastly bigger than um, vastly greater than uh, than the original cost of the truck, and that's why only if you look at trucks, very few uh, truck companies will mm, pick a cheap 
uh, powertrain. Not interested. <clears throat> they will spend the best money they can get or the biggest money they can get on the powertrain that they know will give them a million. And that's what they, they, they look at. It's a million miles um, on a truck before it, and you need to scrap it out and do something else. Yeah, yeah so, not only that, but like a break. I imagine a, lot, a truck breaking down on the road somewhere. I mean, yeah. the cost of, you know, especially if you've got perishable goods or something in there, right. you know, the cost of that offsets right. any savings you might have done by buying a cheap drivetrain. Exactly. A single failure, right? Yeah, yeah. So this sounds like, to me, um, I can see it in three different areas. One is a um, heavy truck and not with batteries, but probably with fuel cells. And then um, looking at the uh, the general consumer um, dropping away from PM magnets and uh, moving toward induction motors. And then that seems like a, a good idea. Most people don't need to have a, a race car. <clears throat> Very few grandmas want to go zero to 60 in a couple of seconds. It doesn't happen. And most people use their car to go to the drugstore or the grocery store they're not going to uh, drive, uh, you know, from their home in Detroit to San Diego. It just isn't going to happen. They, it hasn't happened very often. And I hear all this stuff about, well, I got to buy a truck because once every two years I tow a boat uh, here. There's these guys down the road. They, uh, they rent trucks. You could use one of those instead of hauling around this great big giant, <clears throat> whatever, any, and, so, and then the last one is the one that um, I haven't really thought about at all before, which is the uh, the, the development of a, of a taxi that could run on um, on hydrogen, like a fuel cell, and um, with uh, with an incredible duty cycle. That that strikes me as being, um, at least for me, one of the high points of this converse. Actually, the whole thing was quite good. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to hit because. Um, like I told my guys, um, gee, this sounds like magic, <laughs> you know, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> magic, uh, magic and I don't get along. I've, nor, I've been burned quite a number of times. It's, it's electron. So we're, we're big, we're big on reality. You know, again, we're, we're challenging yeah. we know that, but, um, you know, it's based on physics. It's based, it's just taking physics of electric motors into electronics. It's a natural yeah. progression, um, but it, it, hey, Sandy, one thing I do want to say is even on the commercial truck, uh, I'll say I'm a little bit different than you are, Eric, and that I do think there's a good place for full battery electric commercial trucks. There is. In, for in short that, haul. That kind of, yeah. yeah, exactly. The shorter haul, the mid, the mid duty, yeah. you know, that class three through six. Um, and there's a lot of problems there right now, you know, from a total yeah. cost of ownership, I'm sure you're aware. Well, they, even even on class eight, if you, if you want to have uh, an experience, Go down to Oxnard Docks, and um, that's where that's where uh, Nicola is trying out their battery electric vehicles. Short haul, you know, you've got a, a couple of great big giant freighters that you've got to unload and stuff like that. You have a look at that, and you see huge amounts of smoke, huge amounts of smoke, huge amounts of smoke. No smoke, no smoke. I mean, and and that's all. I mean, it's hot. Yeah. It's hot in California during the day. And these guys have got to run the, air, the AC system. But, sure. I mean, at the end of the day, all they do is stand there and pollute. Um, I'm not a, a not 100% into being a tree hugger, but at the end of the day, this is just plain old stupid. What what happens in that neighborhood? I mean, everything around it is black. I mean, where did that come from? Well, it wasn't from a forest fire or something. This is coming from these big trucks spewing diesel uh, exhaust. <clears throat> so this is the perfect application for battery. You can skip the uh, fuel cell for that. Long haul, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fuel cells, but for this other application where you're unloading trucks and you're, it's really a short haul, but it's a big truck, like what Nickel is doing with, uh, with theirs is, and I drove that truck. I. I drove it and um, and I didn't even know I had a trailer on back. I thought, I, I don't know, I lost my mind, but uh, I got in and drove the thing around 
And then uh, the guy says, well, you might want to ease up a bit going around this curve. <laughs> really? Why? You know, uh, and then I drove it in and stopped it. And he said, well, you handle it really well. Uh, I was a little nervous with the uh, trailer and whatnot when you were going around. What? W what? I had a trailer? And then I got out and I, I thought I was going to faint. I mean, <laughs> but with the power that you've got with electric, no no shifting of gears. and other, It's amazing what you can do. And, and, uh, and quite frankly, I think any dockyard should... Uh, they should only allow, I mean, the, the cities could regulate that. Yeah. Uh, the dockyard and the cities could say, forget it. You, you can't bring a diesel in here. And that would be the end of that. And probably a lot of people in a neighborhood would be a lot happier as well. Yeah. Kind of like you said uh, at the beginning, right? I think in general media is not doing a very good job of telling the right story because with electrification, there is some effort that just makes absolute sense right now. Yeah, yeah. well. The problem I have with a lot of the media stuff is they just get it sometimes so hilariously wrong. No, we can't talk bad okay. about media right now. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I can. You and, can. Uh, and I do. So uh, there you are. I, I personally uh, think that if you're not paying uh, the ransom, like buying ads, you get thrown under the bus. And that's just the way it works. And... Um, these guys, if it bleeds, it reads. And um, hey, if we have to make up a you know a story here and there, well, it's okay. But between marketing, uh, I can't really divulge everything that I talk about either. But marketing, the um, <clears throat> range anxiety thing, and uh, biodiesel is better than. Uh, is less uh, uh, polluting than um, than going with um, uh, you know solar or whatever. On and on and on. <clears throat> Those things all came from marketing agencies. That didn't come from uh, that didn't come from reality, and certainly didn't come from anybody who's an engineer. It's just yeah, and and it catches on. Sound bites really work well uh, for uh, at least for the for the media's. The different media groups so yeah i mean when you even biodiesel is one of those things it's like yeah it works in a small setting but you try to replace <laughs> let's say the united states's diesel consumption with biodiesel and you do the numbers on that it's just like where is it all going to come from yeah well yeah well that wasn't uh, really part of the uh discussion i'm sure at that large german company that we can't talk about